Welcome to the Zoning Board Appeals Meeting. Today's Thursday, December 20th, 2018. I want to remind everybody that the meeting is being taped. Uh, members present, Adam Sokolowski, Bernie Sadowski, myself, Frank Morrow, Kathy Felton, Rich Moody, and Bob Decker. And I believe we'll all be voting tonight. We have to. Uh, That's six. Six. One, one will, one will not vote. Um, has everybody had an opportunity to um, review the minutes from last meeting? Okay. Frank, we have our new assistant town administrator with us tonight. Okay. Okay. Welcome. Welcome aboard. What's your last name again? We have a motion to accept the minutes from last meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor of second? Opposed? Okay, we'll accept the minutes from our last meeting. I'll we'll have a chance to read them. Okay, so on the agenda for tonight, um, the hearing notice in accordance with Deerfield Zoning Bylaw, Chapter 179, Article 3, Solar Electric Installations Environmental Resources Management on behalf of Mass RE 12 LLC has prepared this request for two zoning variances, site use variance and setback variance. The proposed project involves construction of a 20-acre portion of the existing Deerfield Railroad property at 100 Railroad Yard Road, Map 7, Lot 5. The proposed use for this site is to install solar panels that will generate approximately 2.7 megawatts of direct current electricity. Solar generation greater than 2 megawatts requires a site use variance in commercial zones. The solar panels will be installed to the south of the existing rail yard on property owned by Pan Am Southern LLC. The zoning bylaw for commercial zones requires a setback distance of 100 feet from all property boundaries. The project is requesting to change setback to 50 foot front and 25 foot side and rear setbacks. So at this time, Great. Thank you very much, yep. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Tom Reedy. I'm an attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of the applicant um, in the matter that the chairman described. Uh, with me this evening from the applicant, we've got Kyle Purdy from EDM, John Drabinsky from EDM, and Matt Knorr from UGT. Um, so I think what I'd like to do is to do a couple of things, give a little context to what we're asking for, but first I think you know, I'd like to start off with an apology uh, between this uh, hearing and what happened at the, the previous hearing. I know that um, we had, uh, Matt had reached out to a couple of the ZBA members, uh, the minutes weren't online, um, and he thought that he would be able to ask some questions, and I, I want to apologize uh, for that in being inappropriate. Um, he was, I think, confused about what he could and couldn't do. We've had a talk about it, but I, if it made anybody feel uncomfortable, I just wanted to get it out in the open and, and express uh, our apologies for that. I have a comment. I was one of those people contacted, and I was upset about that, that you called me at my private residency twice. Um, I felt that I was being intimidated, changed my vote, and I thought it was totally inappropriate. I checked with counsel, and she told me not to talk to anybody. And then I had town members come to me, and I said I could not talk. And I think they were a little upset with me that I couldn't talk about it. But it caused a problem for me with people that I know that came to me with their concerns. So I am not happy with this whole deal. I think it was totally inappropriate. Um, and to do those kinds of things and call people at their private residency 
and continual call, not once, but twice, uh, was totally inappropriate, and uh, I'm not happy with that. Understood. And we're sorry. Well, it won't affect my vote, but um, I think that that is totally inappropriate, and somebody should have said something yeah, yeah. to him. No, loud, loud and clear, and, and uh, unfortunately it was late that we were able to have that discussion, but that discussion was had, so I was able to talk to Matt. Um, so I'm happy to discuss that further, or we can I, I can move on. I don't want to minimize it by any stretch. So I just want to talk about what we're asking for. And, and as the chairman noted, we're asking for a use variance for the extra large uh, ground-mounted solar photovoltaic facility because. Uh, we trip the, the two megawatt threshold. One of the things to remember is um, the bylaw is silent as to how those megawatts are uh, determined. And so, you know, there's DC and AC. Conservatively, uh, we read the bylaw to mean if you trip two megawatts DC, which is the higher, um, you're going to need a variance. And so that's why we're here before you. Um, as far as the use piece of things. And then we're also asking for some setback variances, so dimensional variances. Uh, and, you know, typically when I get calls from clients to say, hey, we need a variance, I say, okay, um, good luck. Uh, but with this one, it was a little bit different because when I started to look at the project, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the requirements of a variance, something with the soil, the shape, or the topography that specifically affects this parcel that doesn't affect the zoning district generally, and that because of that condition, there's a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, where literal enforcement um, would be caused by that substantial hardship, and that you can allow, without derogating too much from the intent or purpose of the bylaw, the relief that's being requested. And so when I looked at the site and I saw what the soil conditions were, wetlands, first of all, which is a recognized soil condition, and also the brownfields nature of the site, which, you know, this is one of the benefits of this is that there's going to be a, a further cleanup of the property. There's that uh, concrete loading dock that's going to be removed from the property. Um, and then if you look at the shape of it, you've got a pretty unique shape. And, and we were talking in the hallway, and it's kind of a, a lobster claw, where Mass Department of Transportation owns that inner piece. Um, and you've got uh, Pan Am owning kind of the top piece and the bottom piece of it. But in the middle, that sandwich, the meat of the sandwich, if you will, is owned by Mass DOT and used for the railroad. And when you look not only at this lot, but at the lots in the vicinity to get a sense of, well, what are we talking about here? Are, are all of the lots like this? They're not. And so when I started to look at it and say, oh, we've got the soil, we've got the shape, what are we asking for for relief? And the use variance was one. And looking at the use variance, you have to figure out if there is um, a hardship. And in conversations with your building commissioner and, and trying to figure out what else could go here. Because I think of the wetlands and the brownfields nature, you're not going to be able to dig, you're not going to get a permit for a well, you're not going to get a septic system. So you're pretty, pretty limited. The land itself is limited. Not the user, but the land itself is limited. Where you can't really have any other economic viability besides something like we're proposing here. Um, Given the nature of solar, we also think that it's not derogating from the purpose or intent of the zoning bylaw because we think that solar generally is a public good. And I, I'm sure later tonight you'll hear from a Butters who have their other reasons for why this solar should go in there and is not uh, a detriment to the public good. And then besides the use, we, I also looked at what else are we asking for, and, and we're asking for those setbacks, those dimensional variances. And I know that the last time uh, the applicant was here, it was kind of a holistic, here's what we want. Here are the, here's the relief that we want. And I don't know how, I don't think that's accurate enough because we're not asking for that whole relief of the 50 feet or the 25 feet. What, what you have in front of you in your slide packet that we're, gonna, we're happy to go through later are going to be some slides that show in the northern array it's, so, as you know, 100 feet is the setback from the front, the side, and the rear. 
recall that the rear is abutting a railroad. Uh, there is going to be arborvitaes surrounding uh, the rear and the front of the property and also the side of the southerly array. So that front in the northerly array, the closest um, it gets is 65 feet. So we're not asking for 50 feet, we're asking for 65 feet and then even then it's not 65 feet the entire way and I will be able to show that in a slide. And for the, north, uh, for the southern array rather, the front setback we're asking for is 96 feet. So again, not that blanket 50 feet, actually 96 feet. And then on the side, the northern array completely complies. The southern array, there's an, uh, an abutter who is here that I think and hope will speak in support of allowing this setback variance and we're looking for 44 feet from that property line for the southern array. The rear yard setback, uh, the railroad is requiring us to be a certain distance from their property line and then building code 40 feet. And then building code requires 15 feet between the fence and the panels. So we're asking for relief to be 55, 56 feet away from that rear property line. Um, and so I think when you start looking at it in its totality, if the uh, board does approve it, you could approve it, condition on being constructed substantially in accordance with the plans. Uh, we are looking at a site that is unique as to soil and to shape. And our suggestion is, and I think you know, town council would agree that you can do it, and I think our suggestion is that you should do it for some of the reasons that we'll walk through tonight just as far as solar generally, the other types of uses, um, that are allowed in the C2 zoning district and just what this has been used for in the past and how the, the solar use, as benign as it is with the screening that are, that's going to occur, we'll talk about the inverter, we'll talk about um, landscaping and reflection and sight lines and all of that. Why this is a, a good passive benign use for this property uh, and there's some benefit to the town in the form of payments in lieu of taxes uh, so it's probably about $25,000 a year that the town will get um, with payment in lieu of taxes, I'm sure you're aware, is because solar is deemed personal property. Towns and solar developers for predictability have said, well, instead of doing a form of list every year, why don't we just say it is worth X? And so that X is $12,500 per megawatt about. So we're at about $25,000 a year that is contributed to the tax base and I think compared to other uses generally and not in this area, not, not here because I don't, you couldn't put a, a housing subdivision or apartments, but you're not gonna need additional police or teachers or firefighters, et cetera. So it's a net benefit to the town as far as the pilot goes. And then we'll also touch on decommissioning and what happens at the end of its useful life. And we would fully expect that um, a condition be put on the uh, on the approval if the board so grants an approval to require a decommissioning bond and I think we're looking to we can provide additional evidence to whether the building commissioner or the board at a public meeting in the future to say here's how much we think that we need to put and it's twenty five hundred dollars a year for twenty years to adequately make sure that if for some reason UGT goes away, you can't get in touch with Pan Am understanding that you haven't had the best, or they haven't had the best track record with the town. You have this nut that you can crack open and say, okay, we've got enough to remove this, to return it to the state that it was in after it's been cleaned. Um, and, and bring it back to whatever sort of vegetative state after the useful life of it. So it's not like they're gonna be there as an eyesore forever. And I think when you take it in totality, hopefully we provide you with enough evidence, information, et cetera, where you can find your way to grant the use variance and also those dimensional variances as I discussed. I'm happy to answer any questions about all the stuff I just said, but um, if it's okay with the board, we'll turn it over and have um, the professionals walk through what the site's gonna look like. Anybody have any questions? Okay. My name is Matt Norham with Urban Green Technologies. Um, 
I first want to start off, again, I know you touched on it, um, but I do apologize to the board for reaching out personally um, with some most phone calls. So um, guys, like I said, Tom reached out to me after that, um, but I do apologize for doing that. Is that better? Is that better? Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so once again, I, I do apologize for reaching out to you. Um, um, real quick, this is, I guess just to give you background, this is a little bit um, the PowerPoint. I wanted to, after the last couple meetings, um, actually the last meeting that we did have, um, I kind of wanted to realize that we really want to provide you with some more detail over the project itself. Um, so I do have a lot of the questions that were, that were asked. So some of this might sound a little bit repetitive, but I just wanted to walk through it um, with everyone again. Um, and I'll try to hopefully not drag it on too long. Um, but real quick, the development team itself, like I said, with Kyle and John from ERM, um, we also do have Mike Lottie as well from Industrial Engineering, um, who would be, if the project was approved, the, uh, the prime general contractor. Um, as you can see, we have had a lot of consultants working on this project. Um, we have had the wetlands delineated. We've had the stormwater design worked out, um, the phase one report, the grading plan, um, interconnection-wise. We had a shading analysis done because there are lar large trees, not on, just not on the parcel, but also from neighbors and across the road as well. Um, so we have done a lot of work into this project. Um, so that's just some of the consultants that have been involved. <clears throat> UGT ourselves, um, like I said, we've done projects all throughout Massachusetts. It's, it's not our first rodeo. Um, actually, one I wanted to point out is actually Iron Horse 4, which was with UGT, ERM, and actually Pan Am as well. This was in Bill Ricca, Massachusetts. This was a six megawatt project we did. Uh, this was two years ago, it was online. Um, that it was approved. And we've done a couple other projects throughout Borica. UGT, we actually specialize in solar development on brownfields and landfills. And most of these sites that you see here are considered brownfields or landfills themselves. And actually that Schaefer landfill in the bottom left, um, that was actually, that won the EPA Award of the Year in 2014 for the first reuse of a Superfund site for solar. I had the little trophy on the, on the previous slide. Um, but yes, this is just a couple of the projects that we have done. So as you know, the project itself, um, Mass RE 12 LLC, um, it is on a single parcel that is owned by Pan Am. Um, parcel is there. As you can see, we are leasing about 20 acres. However, the project itself is not really 20 acres. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Um, I'll show you in some of these next couple images. So as Tom pointed out, it is quite a unique shape as it does kind of hug around the center rail yard itself. The whole parcel is a single parcel. It's 104 acres and it is zoned as um, commercial, C2. The address is 100 Railroad Yard Road. However, it is right there. It is along River Road. Um, so hence, there's, there are some of the neighbors and the abutters that would be um, impacted by the project. So just a little bit about the project and the site itself. It said it does abut the, rail, abut the rail yard, which is owned by the Commonwealth. It is leased by Pan Am Southern. Um, it is classified as a brownfield from Mass DEP. Um, there are, it was classified as a brownfield because there was multiple releases of oil and contaminated areas, hazardous materials. Um, it was, it's also the previous location of the Lake Asphalt Company. Um, which has now been, that, pro that building has now been torn down. However, there is still the old loading dock there, um, and they are still, it's, it's pr practically cleaned up. Um, the current conditions of the site is there are some still paved roadways, um, some parking areas, the loading dock, as I mentioned, some railroad supplies, some dumping of materials. People have done some illegal dumping there, and just some overgrowth. A um, little bit of a brief history of the project, as you can, of the parcel, as you can see. It was really, 1890s, undeveloped, um, started being used for the railroad in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and, and then on into um, early 06, um, there was the Lake Asphalt Company in the, rail, in the railway, and then also 2010 to 2014, it's when Lake Asphalt was initially um, decommissioned, I guess you would say. These are just a couple of pictures of the current conditions of the site. Um, I don't want to overwhelm you, but like I said, this is some of the old parking areas and the asphalt that was left over. Um, the bottom down there is the southern site um, on the, on the left-hand side there, and there are, some, there are trees on that parcel. So initially, 
why solar and why, why this site? Um, like we said, really, it's, it is a brownfield that would definitely help. We want to help to come and clean it up um, and actually reuse that property, put it to a productive, good use. Um, it would help to be benefit, like I said, the town of Deerfield with the revenue stream, help with site safety and security. Like I said, there's been some illegal dumping and whatnot, but it would help to enclose that area and clean it up. We do have a prior relationship with Pan Am. Like I said, we have done a property with them before, which was also a brown field, which had a asbestos landfill on it as well, that we actually went in there and helped to clean that up with ERM. Um, and then also, like I said, build a solar project there. Solar is a quiet and safe neighbor. It's not gonna put a burden on the town's municipal resources. Um, you know, the railroad right now is not, it's, it's quite loud. They don't wanna have, you know, the neighbors don't want another loud neighbor. So this would help to keep that down. Um, and we also do have an interconnection services agreement with Eversource. You know, we've done studies with Eversource, we did the impact study, and they've said, you know, this is a good site, we can connect you onto the grid, and it's feasible. So the overall plan itself, it's single parcel, and there's two arrays that are on the site. The reason there's two, and I'll cover more later, is in between the two arrays, it's mostly wetlands. And there are residential butters in between. Um, of course, because of setbacks and whatnot, but also mostly just because of the wetlands. That's all mostly wet in there. I do have some additional documentation I'll show you shortly. But the project itself, um, as we spoke of the size, it's actually now 2.5 DC. I'm um, proposing to use some smaller panels on the site, 1.98 AC. The racking system is going to be both post-driven and also ballasted over a small area where there is some a soil covering of an asbestos area, so one of the contaminated soils area on the site. Inverters, we're proposing to use string inverters, which are, I have some other pictures as well, they're smaller, so instead of one big inverter, it's gonna be a bunch of little ones um, that would go behind the solar panels. And um, as I mentioned, most of the property is unable to be developed due to wetlands and the topography of the site in nature. This is just kind of a rendering of what the finished product would look like. Um, you can see the two arrays there the access roads that we have proposed, um, some of the plantings around the site as well. And um, I have some other pictures that we can show too. So just to break it down, just the north array itself, um, the acreage is right around about five and a half acres. Um, capacity is just under one megawatt. Excuse me. Um, the solar panel acreage itself is about three acres. Um, tree clearing wise, we would have to do about 2.2. Um, so that's where we are. Like I said, this, there is a lot of cleared area already. There is that loading dock, which we would be taking apart. Um, we would be, yeah, essentially taking that off the site um, and developing that area there. As you can see, that area in the front here, that is not being proposed to be developed because of a lot of shading <coughs> from the trees across the road. Um, this array itself, actually, it even does drop down 13 feet from the road. And you can see that if you drive by, there's that driveway. It actually drops 13 feet um, when we had the, uh, the survey done. But there is all that shading from the trees across. Those are some pretty tall <coughs> trees. And you know, if you got shade, you're not going to make any solar power. There's, there's no point to put panels there. Um, so that's why there's nothing being proposed there in that area. This is essentially what it would look like at the end um, if it was built. So we did speak at the last meeting. Um, we know that some of the noises were concerns, and I'll talk about this again as well. But essentially, we did propose to do some arborvitae in the front and the rear, um, just to help with some sound mitigation, too, in the visual aspect. So that's essentially what it would look like when it was done. The south array is, um, is similar. Um, it is five, it's be about five acres total, um, right over a megawatt. Um, so the solar panel acreage about three and a half, and tree clearing would be right at about 3.2. There are a lot more trees on this that we would have to, that we propose to clear. And that's essentially what it would look like. And as you can see here, we did also propose um, the trees in the rear, the arbor I should say, in the rear, the front, and then even also on the side as well, because we do know that there would be some visual, um, we still want to create a visual buffer, because we do know those are some of the residents that are right there and um, some of that area is clear, so we want to at least maintain that visual barrier, and for sound as well. So wait, you're adding those south part deciduous trees, or they're already there? Uh, this right here, 
This is this would be um, Arbor, oh, sorry, Arbor Bay. Okay. The so Arbor Bay. Yes. 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 This is uh, this is actually uh, Abraham Road right here. I should okay, say great, this thanks. would be the rear of the site. Yeah. So River Road is over here actually. Different different view from the other. Okay, thank you. But one. No, no, you're welcome. So. So the details itself. Um, like I said, we have tried to use as many local contractors and consultants as we could. Um, subcontractors, we'd be trying to use local contractors as well. Um, it's what we try to tend to do to, with all of our projects. Um, as I mentioned, the wetlands have been delineated. The electricity from the site would be delivered to Eversource, which would then be put onto the grid. Um, we do have an ISA that's executed. Interconnection services agreement, which is executed with Eversource. Tree clearing of about five and a half acres. Um, there would be the vegetative buffer to help prevent the visibility and, um, I'm sorry, pre yeah, prevent the panel visibility and create that sound barrier. We would also propose to have some low-growing grasses below the panels as well just to help with the um, visual aspect and also that requires very little O&M operation and maintenance. Um, the grasses are native to the town of Deerfield and it's very minimal water, very minimal trimming that's needed. Um, it's very, it's a lot of it's self-maintaining. Um, self so I know um, Tom touched on this, but essentially what are, what are we asking for? Um, the use variance, which is extra large scale, is because extra large solar is not permitted in the C2 zone. Um, we do know that there was a use variance granted for Lake Street development that is also on River Road and in the same C2 zone. That was a six megawatt project. That was in August of 2015. Um, setback variances, we are asking 50 feet front, 25 side, 25 rear. The reason we are asking those is because that is what, because that is currently what the um, setback variances are for just in the C2 zone in general, not the solar bylaw, just in the C2 zone is 50, 25, and 25, and that's why we are proposing those. Maybe I could just hump, jump in and make yes. sure that we're clear about exactly what we're asking for, because um, when I was talking, I said, we're going to have from the front 61 feet, mm -hmm. uh, from the rear 56 cool. feet, and so I just... If we're not really asking for those, I don't want yes. to really ask for that. Yes, so, so, so we can, um, so I'm gonna talk on that too. I do have a little more, I'll, I'll show you. Yeah, this I have is a question, you told us 65 and I see 50. Right, so that's, and that's what I was just uh, questioning yes. Matt about, was to make sure that what I asked for was correct. And I'm hearing that it is correct. Yes. And so yes. we would ask that you disregard that because we're not asking for just a blanket 25, 50, 25. It's, we'll get into specificity yes. Probably in the next or yeah, it's the in the next the next slide or two. You'll see. So maybe this is this. Oh, I apologize. Yeah. Yes. So did you say? Are you saying that this that in our zoning we we are asking the town zoning is asking for bigger setbacks for commercial solar than they would for other commercial things? Yes. That is correct. Twice as much. Is that correct? We want 100 feet or lower for, for commercial solar. But for other commercial buildings, we want what? Uh, 50, 25, and 25. It's 50 in the front, and then 25 from the side, and then 25 feet from the rear. Wow. So we want more for commercial solar. Um, mm -hmm. No, no, you're welcome. And I have, I have a slide on that as well, too. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I apologize. Yes, yeah. Go forward real quick. One more. So essentially, like we said, why are we requesting the variances? Um, you know, I don't want to recite it, but yeah, you know, um, pretty much soil condition, irregular shape, existing topography. Um, you know, chapter 48, section 10. That's just summarized right there as well. That's essentially why we are asking for the variances. The solar bylaw does say 100 feet, pretty much full perimeter. Front, 100 feet from the front, 100 feet side yard, 100 feet rear. Um, as I mentioned, the C2 bylaw is 50, 25, and 25, max building height of 35 feet as well. So regarding the soil conditions, as I've mentioned, the site is classified as a brownfield by MassDEP. This is the formal location of the asphalt, um, Lake Asphalt Manufacturing Plant. Um, essentially, the cleanup activities that were involved for that were lead and petroleum compounds in the soil, petroleum compounds in the groundwater, and low concentrations of asbestos in the soil. So a lot of that work has been completed. Like I said, ERM, they're actually the LSP, the um, licensed site professional. 
of the site. Um, they've been working on that. They can speak more on this if we do have other questions on this. Um, but there is currently a, there is groundwater, mon uh, groundwater monitoring on site. And the soil cover that over the remaining asbestos impacted soil, which is highlighted in blue up there. Our site, as I mentioned, would be going over some of that, and that would be a ballasted racking system, so there would be no penetration of the soil. The shape of the parcel, um, essentially there's several points of this parcel that are less than 200 feet wide. Um, as you know, the current solar bylaws are about 100 feet front, 100 feet side, 100 feet rear. I mean, you can put two and two together with the front and rear setback, but the parcel itself, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work. What we have highlighted in red is essentially the developable area that you would be able to use. And as you see that area, it shrinks down the project pretty greatly. Um, and the area that you could use is most of it's actually shaded in the north, and then the rear would um, shrink down pretty substantially as well. Um, there is a 25-foot rear setback from, um, from the rail yard. And then there's another 15 foot setback from the fence to the solar panels, which is per the building code, code so that's required. Um, is that the rear reduce I have? Yeah, so yeah. And the topography of the site as well. Um, I know I've mentioned the shading of the trees really hinders what can be developed there. Um, once we did have the wetland delineation performed throughout the parcel, 18 different wetlands and several intermittent streams were actually identified on the site. What I have here is the map that was available. This is what we used initially, just when we do a first preliminary assessment so provided by MassDEP. You can look at this for pretty much any property throughout, um, throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So you can see the parcel is actually right here. This is where the south array would be. This is the north. The green and the blue is wetlands. So that's what MassDEP has, has mapped. So you can see that they have some on the other parcel I should say the same parcel, but what we're not using from Pan Am, there's nothing on ours that we're proposing to use. However, if you could click, um, when we actually got the site delineated, this is a little harder to see. This is what we're using. This is the south array. Right. We're proposing to build it here. This is all wetlands. This wasn't shown before. This is all wetlands, what's in between that tree line. This is all wetlands, all the way up to where that loading dock is. That's the old big asphalt loading dock. We're proposing to build kind of right in here where there's no wetlands. You can see there's even wetlands that are in the front as well, and even further along to the north. That's all wetlands. That would pretty much help to actually it would prevent any other development that could be done on the site. So like I said, we're trying to use just the areas that aren't wetlands. Yeah, so yes, as, um, so as Tom mentioned too about the minimum setbacks, this is where we go into further detail again. Um, I know we spoke on this a little bit, but as you saw, um, really I know what we were proposing was the 50, 25, and 25. However, this is really, that was what we had in our application. So I wanted to clarify that this is really though what we would pretty much propose. Is, um, you can see the minimum that we would need overall for the whole site would be 65. Um, you can see that there from River Road. Uh, to where the very first, to where the closest solar panel would be for the property line. In the, um, yeah, for the north array, 58 feet for the north array would be to the rear, um, to where the rail yard is, and the side as well, the side that's over 1,700 feet that way. Um, and then um, down here, uh, I apologize. 44. 44, oh yeah, 44 for the south array. Um, it's 44 actually from the closest abutter. Um, I guess I've spoken to Mr. Butter. Uh, he is here. I think we can talk if there's questions. Um, it is 96 feet from the front, uh, for the frontage as well. So this is actually almost close to the 100 foot by law. And then I'm 56 from the rear as well. So the minimum that we would really be asking for is um, 65, as you can see, um, 44, and then 56. Um, slide 22. Oh, that there? Yes, yes. So, yeah. So this is, um, like we said, so this is kind of what we once we went through the assessment. The fencing isn't considered a structure. It's the panels that are considered the structure itself. Mm -hmm. So essentially, and I mean, you know, you got to consider other developments that can be done at the site. Um, Mass DOER 
does encourage designated locations in industrial and commercial districts, um, which this is a commercial district, um, and also on vacant or disturbed land, which this is vacant and disturbed land. Um, this is quoted actually, and there's a guide as well I quote in, in another slide, and um, I apologize for not having the reference on there, but um, as it states, when assessing the impact of new ground mounted solar arrays, communities and stakeholders should carefully consider other types of development that might take place in a location no solar, if there was no solar installation. As we mentioned, commercial development is limited to 35 feet in the commercial zone for the bylaws. Um, essentially, if there was to be, there's 16 other permitted uses by right, 37 other uses that can be authorized as special permit and per the Deerfield bylaws. I know you all know this, but just for the public to educate them. Um, you know, and include service shops, repair shops, whatnot. This would have a great increase on the noise and daily traffic of neighbors, which I know they're already burdened with from the road themselves, and they don't want to have that happen. So kind of going back to our past meeting and some other past meetings with the planning board too, um, some of my the next couple slides are some questions that a lot of people asked, and so I kind of wanted to summarize them real quick here. Um, so essentially, can the project be downsized? And ultimately, it can't. Um, per the terms with the IS, of our ISA, Interconnection Service Agreement with Eversource, it, it can't be, you can't change it. It would be considered a substantial change to the application, which then you would have to reapply and it's a 12 month process to reapply with them. Um, and then as you know, it's not, it's not cheap either, we understand that, but it's just mostly the timing aspect of it would not work. The project would no longer be viable, unfortunately at that stage. Um, the smart tax credits, which I'll talk just briefly about the smart program in one of the next slides, um, would be exhausted. Essentially, some people were asking about noise from inverters and just you know noise in general from the project. Um, the inverters, like I said, we're using string inverters, so there's gonna be not one large, but multiple small inverters. Um, they're rated actually less than 40 decibels um, at three meters. Um, so the inverters themselves, as you can see that small picture, they're actually mounted behind the solar panels. The solar panels would actually face south, and so the inverters are actually behind it. That would kind of help to create a buffer even away from River Road and the residents. It would be kind of going backwards towards this backside that you would see here would be towards the railroad itself. Um, and so we would also have the Arbor Vitae, as we said as well, to help act as a noise barrier. This is, um, that was a clip actually from the actual, um, um, I, oh wow, well, I apologize, the manufacturer spec sheet for the inverter. Um, and then that was a little reference guide too. 40 decibels is essentially the equivalent of a refrigerator running. Some people have asked about increased noise from the rail yard and also the impact of lights from the rail yard. As we mentioned, we kind of, we worked, we spoke with you know, the abutters at some of the, uh, the open hearings on um, site plan review, and we did propose the Arbor Vitae, as you can see on both the front and rear of the north array and the front rear and side of the south array as well. Um, just to help with that noise barrier. We also did, you know, there would be the fence behind it. Um, some, uh, some people commented on the loud boom that you hear from the rail yard. As John mentioned at the last meeting, it's actually called the hump, which is circled in red. That's essentially where the train cars get mounted together, they join together. Um, so it's kind of a hill and they slam the car down and that's how they join them together. That actually originates behind the tree line. What's in solid green there that you can see is trees that we are not impacting. Those trees are gonna stay the same as they are. So that still natural buffer is gonna be there. Those green dots that you see, that's gonna be the plantings that we're gonna do with the Arbor Vitae. So we are gonna be maintaining that existing tree line um, to actually help mitigate that. And regarding the lighting, um, I have reached out to Pan Am to ask them if they can do some type of shielding or what they could do with the lighting. They said they are currently actually assessing lighting upgrades for the rail yard itself. Um, whether it's LED or seals or whatnot, they are looking, that's all I have from them at this time, um, that they are trying to look into actually improvements for that site. Um, just to continue on real quick, um, like I said, I mentioned before, you know, the panels would help to act as a noise barrier itself. As I mentioned, the north array is pretty clear, so actually panels there and the Arbor Vitae would actually help to deflect noise in that area. Um, there have been many reports and case studies and I can provide more information on that too, um, of solar panels being used as noise barriers. It's pretty common in Europe, not so much in the US, um, but it is, they are used as noise barriers around highways and even other rail lines as well, uh, which is kind of ironic. 
And um, even panels, it's been proven that panels on rooftops actually do even provide as a noise dampener as well. Any hazardous materials? What you see here, this picture, this is actually a document um, we've quoted from before in our application, as our, our planning board application. Um, it was actually produced by Mass Department, um, yeah, yeah, the Department of Energy Resources, Mass DOER, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental um, Protection, which is Mass DEP, and the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, Mass CEC. Um, so they all, this is three different state departments that actually put together this little FAQ, frequently asked questions if you call it, um, that was given to just not residents of the, um, the Commonwealth, but also the municipalities as well, for their, just for their basic knowledge of solar and whatnot. Um, so I mean, really just to summarize it, solar panels, when they first came out, they did have some hazardous chemicals in them, were made of hazardous materials. Nowadays, technology's you know, evolved. Our panels that we're proposing on the site do not contain any hazardous materials. They are encased in glass. Um, the glass, however, is like a car windshield. It has that coating over it that helps keep it from shattering. It's not gonna shatter into a thousand little pieces. Um, it's gonna hold up, but they're very strong. Um, there's no MSDS material safety data sheet, because people will say, can I see the MSDS? And there's not one there because there's no hazardous chemicals in it. Um, transformers, you know, they do talk in transformers. Some transformers do use toxic coolants. Um, I mean, we're not proposing to use that, and there are, we do have some concrete pads on the site, and those pads are gonna house, there's gonna be a total of two transformers on the site, um, and there will be, which will house switch gear as well. No. So, um, yes. so uh, glare from panels, I know that's came up before. Um, so all, um, essentially there's really no glare from panels. All modern panels have an anti-reflective coating on them. Um, they actually do install solar panels at airports. So I mean, that's got, it's, it's pretty safe um, with, uh, with airplanes. But um, so the solar panels are designed to only reflect 2% of incoming light. You know, they're solar, they're designed to absorb light. They're made of dark materials. Um, any glare is a very rare, rare coincidence. Um, and it's, they're designed to absorb light. Um, and so there are many projects throughout the U.S. and like I said, mostly international where they are installed, installed at airports. And that one right there is actually an eight megawatt project. And I believe it's Thunder, uh, it's thunder I apologize, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Visibility of the project from the roadway. I know this was a very big one, especially when, I was, when ERM and I, Kyle and I were going around talking to the neighbors. They wanted to make sure I don't want to have to see it every day if I drive by it. Um, this is essentially what we proposed with the arborvitae planting, essentially that it would not be visible from the roadway. Two staggered rows of arborvitae would be, is proposed. Um, the height of the panels themselves on the racking is about six feet at most. Um, we would be proposing, I know one of the residents asked us to, try to camouflage the fence, which we said we would do, black, dark green, whatnot. Um, and then also there is in that north array, as I mentioned earlier, there's a 13 foot drop in elevation too. So you would have the plantings up high and then the panels even drop further down to help prevent that visual aspect. The existing site conditions and decommissioning of the project. Um, so there is a concrete loading dock that we said is left over from the Lake Asphalt project, which we are proposing to demolish and remove all that material off the site. There is some unused rail equipment that would be disto uh, disposed of by Pan Am. The decommissioning of the project. Um, I know we didn't talk on this too much before, but um, essentially a bond would be posted up that would guarantee the removal from the site. Um, the bond would be posted after the issuance of the building permit. The scrap value of the project, what's kind of like the scrap value of the project is actually worth more than the removal costs. It sounds kind of weird, but actually the secondary market for panels and the recycling of the steel that would be used is actually incentivizes the removal of the site because it's, it's worth more than what it costs to remove it. Um, but however, this would, you know, conditions with the planning board we can discuss, but we would, you know, propose to place $2,500 per year for 20 years in escrow. Um, so, I mean, that's just what we're proposing initially, but as a condition. Um, for the, I know some residents have asked about this um, the current asbestos area that's on this site. Um, and this is, ERM could probably talk a little bit more about this than I can. Um, so I'm not too sure if maybe John or Tom, I'm not too sure if you guys maybe want to speak more on it. 
Um, but essentially, there is, like I mentioned, there is a little asbestos area um, that we would be doing a ballasted solution over. We would not be penetrating that soil cover of that contaminated asbestos soils. Um, I mentioned it would be, yeah, it's post, it's be post-driven racking throughout the rest of the site, though, but not over that contaminated area. Um, we would, however, you know, if a ram process, uh, the ram process would be um, required with the public meeting in a 30-day comment period, though, if the project were approved. Um, if it approved, the ram, yeah, the ram plan would be submitted to Mass DEP um, for review. Essentially, really quick, the SMART program, I know we've always talked about it, no one really knows, I mean, some of you might know what it is, but just a quick brief, it's essentially the solar incentive program sponsored by Eversource, National Grid, and Unitil, the main utilities in um, Commonwealth. Um, it's actually trying to um, support the development of 1,600 uh, blocks of new solar capacity. It's a declining block program, there's essentially eight blocks, the, that incentive rate goes down every block. Um, with Eversource West, which is where we are in Deerfield, it's about 12.6 megawatts per block, a total of 100 megawatts for the whole program. There's three requirements to apply for this program. One of them is site control, which is own the property or have a land lease. Number two is an interconnection services agreement with the utility. I should back up and say site control wise, we do have a land lease with Pan Am Southern, so we do fulfill that requirement. The interconnection services agreement, we do have an executed ISA with Eversource as well. And number three is all applicable non-mysterial permits. We have received our order of conditions from the um, Conservation Commission. However, we are here today asking for um, you know, the use variance and the setback variances. And we have met with the planning board, as you know, from our past meeting, uh, with the site plan review and the planning board. You know, they, they do approve of the project, but of course, we are here today to ask for the use variance and the setback variances. So currently, the status of the SMART program. It opened on November 26, and Eversource West for large projects, the capacity for the program was exhausted by November 30th. So essentially, there's currently a wait list for new applicants. I know I spoke about this at the last meeting, um, and it, yeah, it did fill up. However, there is a wait list. The program is now on a first come, first serve basis. So the sooner you apply, the better your chances to get in. The current applicants are still under review. So they're making sure, as those, you saw, those three requirements, land lease, or I'm sorry, site control, ISA, and the permits. They're still under review, you know, checking with the towns, to make sure everything's good. Um, so there is, a ch there is a chance that possibly some of those applicants might be removed from the program. There is also now a petition in place. I don't have it up. There's a petition in place um, to actually merge now Eversource West and Eversource East territories into one Eversource territory, which would essentially double then the capacity that's available, which would then allow for that, the program to reopen back up again for Eversource West. So real quick with our ISA that we do have, we do essentially we have, the pro we have preserved capacity at the nearest substation, um, which I believe is in Greenfield. It's a little bit north of the site. Um, this was executed in June of 2018, and the reason why this was executed early on, because as I mentioned, this is a 12-month study. So you initially apply, you submit the application, they look it over, say, okay, you can connect, but we got to go further down and see what these costs are for you to connect. So they take the study. It does take about eight months to do the study. We got it back. They said you can connect, but you have to do such and such upgrades to get there, and they give you a price plus minus 25%. That's essentially what we got. That's why we executed this earlier on, um, was just to get that study underway, because there are a lot of projects right now that have been approved, not just in Deerfield, but elsewhere, that have been approved. However, they don't have an active ISA. They're waiting on that from Eversource. As you know, with the SMART program, you saw how quick it filled up within the first week. There's projects now that have are waiting on their ISA, and there's a chance you're not going to get one because there's just so much capacity being proposed on not just the distribution but transmission lines is that it's too saturated. So that's kind of some of the issues that are going on. So we do have an active ISA with Eversource. Um, and essentially how that works, like I said, we're in the front. If we end up getting pulled out of it um, from our ISA, if we can't commit to it, um, essentially that, capacity, that allocation goes to a different project in line that's behind us. So then, and that substation in, that's in Greenfield serves, you know, Greenfield, Deerfield, other surrounding municipalities as well, not just, you know, not just Greenfield, not just Deerfield. 
Um, so it does, so that capacity gets allocated elsewhere to other towns, which essentially could receive, you know, the net tax revenue. I'm almost done, I promise, like three more slides. Um, so the, uh, overall the impacts to the neighbors. Um, erosion and sediment control will be implemented during and after construction. There was a GZA environmental, um, environmental um, consultants. They did review, they performed the third party review for the town of Deerfield. Um, and they did this, um, they reviewed our stormwater design as well. We had some comments straight back and forth. Everything has been approved and well, that was um, discussed at a, at a prior planning board meeting. Um, as we mentioned, there's no wetlands we're not impacting that. No wetlands or sensitive wildlife habitats will be disturbed. We are gonna be maintaining that tree barrier in between the two arrays as well. Um, we're proposing to install stop signs. This was at the request of one of the abutters at one of the prior planning board meetings to install stop signs at the um, proposed entrances and access roads of the projects for during the traffic, during the construction traffic. And then also, as we mentioned, there would be grasses and low growing vegetation planted underneath the panels as you can kind of see in the render we did there. I want to touch base because I know Pan Am did send a letter to the ZBA a few days ago. Um, I'm not too sure if you all have had a chance to review that. Um, they sent me a copy as well, but I'm not too sure if you want to read it out loud or not, or, um, or I can, but essentially this is just a quick summary of what they did say, is that you know they are, they, Pan Am is, they are pursuing a tenant for the property. Like I said, they've spoken to us because we did our project in Borica, which has acted as a showcase for them to show that they're trying to actively clean up their properties and put them to a good use. They want to generate revenue. They don't want to just have it sit there and go to waste and keep paying taxes on it. That's why they contacted us about doing this property. Um, there was a salt storage facility proposed on this parcel itself in 2017, early 2017. As you know, it did not go through. Um, there was a lot of opposition from the abutters in the town itself. Um, but they still are trying to find someone for this parcel. They do want to work with us. Um, as I mentioned, we did our project in Iron Horse Park, which was a super fun site. It's actually, this project right here is the one we did with Pan Am. So that was a six megawatt project on a brownfield as well, an asbestos land, partially an asbestos landfill. And um, Pan Am, they know that they haven't been the best neighbor, but they know that the neighbors have now, you know, they're advocating, I've been in communication with them, the neighbors, they do have some, um, they do are advocating for the project and they, um, you know, Pan Am recognizes that and they want to pursue this as well. So. Essentially the benefits of the town of Deerfield, um, we do, you know, propose an apology agreement with the tax assessor and um, so like I said, this is still, it's not finalized yet, but proposed is um, essentially, you know, 12, um, 12 five per megawatt um, terms, about 20 years, be about, Five, it would be about $500,000 over the life of the project of new, ta of new tax revenue to the town of Deerfield. This would be for personal property taxes, um, and essentially the real estate taxes would be, our, our project would be paying its portion of that to Pan Am. Um, and I know there were comments last meeting about Pan Am, if they're behind on their taxes, they've been known for that. I checked with them, they sent me some info, I'm not too sure if they sent it to you, but they are up to date on their taxes. I know I believe they just received a recent tax bill, um, but there's no back taxes on, on that parcel up to date. The benefits of the neighbors, um, solar project is not gonna increase traffic. It's not gonna be an increase in traffic on River Road. The project's gonna be a quiet neighbor for the next 20 to 30 years. Um, typical life is 20 years, but um, it's gonna be a quiet neighbor for then. It's gonna be, need very little operation and maintenance services on the site. As we mentioned with the low growth grass, it's very little trimming every couple months. Doesn't need to be watered. Um, the rainwater essentially cleans the panels. You know, they're at an angle. It cleans the panels themselves. Snow falls off the panels. The equipment's re uh, monitored remotely. So really someone just has to come out there every few months or if something gets triggered. Um, essentially an increased security at the site due to the fencing. And uh, as we mentioned, it'd be productive reuse. To try to help beautify that area as well. Regarding, like I said, with uh, public engagement, um, as I mentioned, Kyle and I, we did try to go out and speak with a lot of the abutters. Um, that abutters there, even further down the road too. I was able to touch base with a good amount of people those past couple months. There were still some that I had not been able to meet in person. I know a lot of them have come here to these meetings um, back to back. Um, so we have, when we initially went out there and spoke to them, a lot of people, you know, they weren't neither for it nor against it. They just said, we just don't know enough about it. We just want to be educated on it. So they were always invited to come to these meetings, which a lot, most of them did just to try to be educated on the subject and just learn more. 
and ultimately, you know, once they learned it, we're, that we're trying to work with them. We're not the railroad, we're trying to work with them, and that they realize that, it's, um, that we want to be a good neighbor. So, and I wanted to touch base too, and I apologize for I'm talking a little fast, but um, we know in our November 15th meeting, the joint hearing with the planning board, um, it was supposed to be, we were kind of going back and forth a little bit. Planning board was kind of catch 22. You guys want more input from planning board. Planning board wanted input from you for going forward, and we had the joint hearing. However, when I um, did review the, uh, the YouTube video, again, the minutes of the, of the, um, the video of the, uh, I'm sorry, the minutes of the meeting, I kind of realized, too, back and forth, that the planning board really, they really didn't speak too much. And I'm not trying to bash the planning board, but they really didn't give you enough feedback and recap of what happened at their previous meetings and about the project in general. They really did. And so i really trying to blame really just ourselves. We really should have educated you better on the details of the project. We should have told you exactly what we were asking, that we you know, reached out to the neighbors, and really, ultimately, I mean, the blame is really on ourselves for it. So that's why we're trying to be here today, and I, that's why I just went through this long and try to be detailed presentation to just be fully transparent and clear of exactly what's been asked, what's been covered at all the meetings, and try to summarize these last few months just into this PowerPoint. Um, so I really hope I did that. And again, like I said, is really we just wanted to, we want to work with you. Um, we were trying to work with the neighbors. We want to work with the town to make this project work. So, thank you. Yes. First question. Yes. A little bit of clarification on your calculations on the megawatts. Mm hmm You didn't state whether it's AC or DC. Okay. Yeah. And in your slide presentation, you had two different numbers in there for your, what you're asking for. The last number. calculation yes. versus the DC calculation. And our bylaw is not specific on how that calculation is determined. So I would like that a little bit clarified. So because I have two electricians sitting here and we either one of them to ask the same question. So I got a question for Dick. You want what clarified for if you want to I want the, how the, how the calculations were arrived at if they did the calculations on the DC, which then get converted to AC, because they're two different numbers entirely. Correct, electricians? Correct. Well, my opinion is the zoning enforcement guy, my opinion is the calculations can be done on AC. Well, I can provide a little bit of clarity on that. I'm Mike Lottie with Industrial Engineering. Um, we, the, the AC calculation is the output of the inverters, which there's 44 inverters on site, and each one is 45 kilowatts. Um, the DC is actually the sum of all the solar panels, because each solar panel is rated at 385 watts. There's, I don't know the exact number offhand, but close to 7,000 solar panels. So what happens is there's a loss from conversion from DC electricity to AC electricity. So the utility runs pretty much completely with approvals in AC. Um, they don't really care how much DC is behind the inverters because the inverters are the ones that put out the electricity at the AC rating. Okay, the question is, which I'm asking is, are the calculations that you presented tonight, are they AC calculations or DC calculations? I'm well aware of the output and what's required by the power company. What I'd like is to clarify for the people that are here so they understand, is it, is it, if it's a 1.9 megawatt output you're looking for, it doesn't need anything from the zoning board. Well, the, the problem we have is it's not clear in the regulations which one it is. So we want to provide both, but it's really both. There's the AC and DC counts. So. I just gave you an opinion from his <laughs> opinion as a zoning enforcement is that it's an AC calculation because that's the actual usable kilowatt. I would agree. I would agree. You know, I've got two electrical people here, and I absolutely like to join in on comment. <laughs> yeah, we would prefer the AC, obviously. We were trying to be fair and transparent by providing both. Well, that's what we're trying to do is be fair with you to start with. You know, the uh, answer here from town council, basically, we can we can approve it as far as they're concerned if we wanted to. It's up to our... All right, I, I want to try to regain a little control here. I mean, we started with the presentation and the PowerPoint, and if you guys are all done, then I'll open it up for questions from, from
from the public, you know, without everybody just shouting here and looking for a mic. So yes. you guys are comfortable, you're done with your PowerPoint. So at this point, if somebody has a question, let's do it one at a time and I'm gonna limit the time so that we're here all, not here all night. And so, state your name and address, please. Thank you, yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Thank, thank you, it was a very good presentation, yeah. Anybody with a question or a concern? Bruce. Yes, please. <clears throat> uh, Bruce St. Peter's from uh, Rob's Way in South Deerfield. Uh, last month I had made uh, some comments and uh, and my biggest concern was whether, you know, the authority of some of the boards to ch uh, go against radically changing the uh, use chart. And based on some new information I had received, yeah, right. as well as this revised mm -hmm. policy, uh, yeah, that I would have to go back to my original introduction last you month, have, have that, uh, that it's a great p uh, use for that particular piece of property. It's a rubbish piece of property. And my an other answers to my other concerns I had at that point have been answered. Now, as far as the ACDC thing, that's one of the things. And uh, if anybody had watched the original planning board, uh, they admitted that they had not, uh, that the, plan the uh, bylaw did not uh, uh, clearly define whether the submissions had to be AC or DC, so they were going to allow worst case scenario, if that's the way you want to put it. In which case, at this point, now the show, figures are showing at 1.98, and as far as I'm concerned, that would bring it right back into the C2 uh, allowances, and therefore, you know, my concerns of last month uh, have been met. So at this point in time, you know, uh, providing the uh, uh, board is willing to uh, uh, give variances on the uh, setbacks and so forth, I, I, I think it's a great use for the project, for that particular piece of land. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. Anybody else? Yes? Lynn Rose, McClellan Farm Road. First of all, it was a great presentation. I don't even know if this is on, but... It is. We can hear you well. Okay, Thank great. You. Um, I just had a question. I had uh, two quick questions about, because the state of Massachusetts is in a butter, what relationship do they have in terms of comments? Because the state is in a butter, they own, they actually own the land under the tracks. I think I've got to answer that. Okay. I think I've got to clarify something here. That's, uh, I didn't think I'd, I am, I will, but the state is an owner and Pan Am, the state is the state park and Pan Am is federally controlled. As the building inspector or anything else, we have zero jurisdiction over that state federal entity. The only thing that can go in there, Pan Am can do anything they want any time they want. The only thing that can go in there is something that they lease back to somebody else like an independent entity like this. That we have jurisdiction over. We do not have jurisdiction over other things. I want to go back five years ago. Five years ago when they were replacing the rails, they put about 10 trailers in there for the migrant camp workers from all over the country and they even put a food trailer in there. I tried to do an enforcement to make them comply with Board of Health regulations, et cetera, et cetera. And the answer I got back from the people was, if you come on the property again, you'll be arrested by the railroad police, okay? So the only jurisdiction, again, we have is over, it could have been over the salt shed, and it can be over this. But anything the railroad wants to do, they want to put stuff back in there, use it for trailer storage, railroad tide pilings, whatever they want to do, can't stop them. I just okay, want to thanks. clarify that for everybody so there's a definite line. So I wanted to clarify, thank you. I don't know if any other responses to that. Did you ask about comments from the from state? From the state. So I. I don't know that we have any specific comments from them, but they would be treated like any other abutter and receive the appropriate notification and be aware of the time, place, uh, et cetera, of the meeting. Okay, thank you. 
So the other thing is I did a lot of research since the last meeting that I was at, and um, so that's where um, it turns out under the Mass Contingency Plan, which is the state super fund, they, um, Pan Am is required, or the, I don't know, the, the, you know, the company that's leasing the land is required to do the release abatement measure, and then we'll have the public meeting. So, and then my understanding from DEP was they contacted the railroad, so if you get the permit, then you will go ahead and um, do that. And let me just say, so I mean, my sense from DEP, talking to DEP, this is a great brownfields use. It's probably not gonna be an issue, but I just wanted to say I had to clarify that. And then lastly, I think the sound is something that we would deal with in site plan review. Because I, I mean, my question is you keep talking about arborvitaes. I do some sound management within buildings and I just don't know what that's based on using arborvitaes. Usually you do the pre and post study and figure out, you know, and then if there needs to be mitigation, what kind of materials you would use at that point. So just curious about why you keep seeing arborvitaes. I know it makes a visual screen, but maybe that's something we deal with at the uh, site plan review. I don't know if you want to hear that or not. That's outside of our jurisdiction. John Drabinsky, uh, actually the LSP for the site. We did talk to uh, John Ziegler at uh, Mass DEP. He's well aware of the project. We did discuss the process with him. And as Lynn just uh, described, we will have a, a RAM plan and have the public uh, hearing process. And it's, we've been doing that out there for how long, Lynn? Maybe 15 years? So, uh, so we'll, we'll keep that process going and it'll be totally transparent. Thank you. Frank, these yes. are two cards at the state site for your notice. I guess just clarifying that they received notice okay. of the hearing. Okay. Hi. Hi. Steve Assing, 795 River Road. I've been in a butter for 20 years to the site. Um, first off, I'd like to ask could you read the letter from Pan Am so the rest of us can, can hear it? Would you like me to read it? Would you like to? Sure. You can. Go ahead. Dear Chairman Morrow, so, in light of the outcome of the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting of November 15, 2018, opposing the requested use and setback variances for the 2.5 megawatt DC solar project, I am reaching out on behalf of Pan Am Southern LLC, the current property owner of 100 Railroad Yard Road. In support of the revised setback variances, the railroad has been the owner of this 104-acre property since the mid-1800s and has a long history of past uses and developments, including the use of railroad loading operations. Most recently, we have been in discussions with many interested parties to develop the property and put it to a productive revenue-generating use, including a recent proposal to develop a salt storage facility. The property will be put to a productive good use, which would greatly benefit the local community and remain a quiet neighbor. Developing the property as a green energy facility would ensure that the site remains a quiet neighbor. The current developers, Urban Green Technologies LLC, have kept us informed of their progress and studies performed for the project since last May 2017. An enormous amount of time and money has and is continuing to be invested into this project. They are also very concerned about being a good corporate citizen and a productive community contributor in Deerfield. Their project will bring only positive monetary and non-monetary benefits to the neighbors and the town of Deerfield. This isn't the first solar project Pan Am and Urban Green Technologies have developed together. Urban Green Technologies developed a similar property of ours for a 6.0 megawatt DC solar project in, I'm not from Massachusetts, I don't know how to say this word. Thank you, Massachusetts in 2016. That project has been a great success with the town and is used as a showcase for Pan Am. The subject property is currently generating about 20,000 of property tax revenue annually to the town of Deerfield. Typically, solar project generate about 10,000 per megawatt direct current in personal property taxes annually. Our understanding is that the project developers budgeted proposing 10,000 per megawatt DC and with this being a 2.5 megawatt DC solar project, the city is missing out on an additional 25,000 of tax revenue annually. This equates to an additional 500,000 of revenue to the town of Deerfield over the next 20 years. I am asking for your support to approve the requested use and setback variances at the December 20th meeting. The developers have remained proactive throughout this process and are eager to positively contribute.
tribute to the town. We understand the developers have been actively engaged in conversations with both town officials and the abutting residents. Pan Am also wants to honor their requests and contribute as a good neighbor as well. The social and economic benefits of the project are admirable as the project won't only produce energy with no greenhouse gas emissions, but also employ numerous local parties and provide revenue into the local and state economies. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Sincerely, Phil Kingman, Senior Vice President, Pan Am Systems. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Um, also, did you guys receive a copy of the petition that went around the, the neighborhood abutting the, uh, the project? The signatures? Yes, I yes. have seen it. Yes. I read it. Thank you. Do you want to read that out, or, or shall I read it? You want to read it? You can. I'd rather you read it. I was feeling the same way. All right. Uh, so basically, there was a, a, a petition passed around to the, to the neighborhood. Um, this is this is how the petition read to the and, and a letter to you uh, to the members of the zoning board of appeals and planning board. We are abutters and neighbors living on River Road and are asking the ZBA to grant two zoning variances that ERM is requesting for the solar project off of River Road. We fully, fully support this pro solar project. The developer has informed us that they have revised the design to scale back generation capacity from its earlier proposal and will present, present a planned drawing showing how the setbacks will vary from location to location. The neighborhood is comfortable with both the scale of the project and the setback distances provided in ERM's revised site plan. We think this project is far, far better for the neighborhood than any other possible future development. We know the railroad is actively seeking some sort of business for this property. Our neighborhood already worked hard last year against a proposed salt storage building, which was eventually withdrawn. The salt development would have created a significant increase in traffic both on River Road and routes 5 and 10 of noise and of pollution. Because of the site's commercial zoning, there's any number of future possibilities for this site that would be undesirable, detrimental for our neighborhood. Examples could include trash transfer, LP, gas terminal, oil terminal, fuel depot, so on and so forth. Uh, regarding the tree cutting, which would be on the, the southern ray, um, the neighborhood realizes that for any other industrial project or commercial project um, going into that area, the trees will be cut anyway, and, and uh, potentially far worse than, than for this solar project. The solar project developer has promised to plant uh, an arborvitae screen that will serve for both visual screening and, and sound buffer, to put in more aesthetic looking fence, to make an escrow fund for eventual decommissioning and cleanup, and to do the least deciduous tree cutting necessary. They have agreed to ask the railroad to shade some of the lights that bother one of the residents. During construction for increased safety, the developer has agreed to put stop signs on both sides of the project where the trucks come uh, exit. This solar project would have the least impact on the neighborhood in terms of noise, traffic, aesthetics, after the initial construction. It will create revenue for the town in the form of taxes and will help create more fossil, fossil free energy. Please say yes to this project. Thank you. Um, I think the record might show that we had 35 signatures on there. And those are, those are, those are just residents uh, w around the, the, uh, the sites. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Go ahead. Hi, my name is, can you hear me? My name is Ava Gibbs, and I live at 617 River Road. Um, I'm probably going to mention some things that have been mentioned over and over, but they bear mentioning. Uh, first, I want to appreciate and thank the ZBA and the Planning Board for serving. Volunteers run our town, and we are very grateful for their thoughtfulness and all the time they invest. I, I want to say, I didn't write this, but I've been to many, many meetings in this past year about the marijuana, 
and the Dollar General, I can't even name them. And I really, really appreciate the time that our boards put in. It's tremendous. So you review plans and reports, and citizens' letters, and you listen to the public and the applicants. We could not run the town without you. And we know that you have the best interests of the town as you consider decisions. So first, I just want to say thank you, because I, I really got it this year. So as a neighbor of the proposed solar project, I have undergone an evolution in my thinking. I think it's safe to say that many of my neighbors and abutters of this project have also undergone the same evolution. The railroad has not been the most wonderful business to deal with. In fact, they have been awful. And so the neighborhood almost has a visceral objection to any idea that comes from them. But in this case, the neighborhood realizes that the solar project is something very positive to the neighborhood and that the solar developers have been very, very responsive to our concerns. The neighborhood is satisfied with what the developers are doing and we actively want this project. We gathered 35 signatures for the petition that's asking you to grant the developers their variances, although it might just be one variance now, and allow the project to be built. Well, these 35 signatures were gathered person to person at each neighbor's and abutter's house. You know, they just weren't a, an online press the button stuff. We actually talked to each person who signed. <coughs> Almost every abutter has signed this petition with the exception of out of town owners and those who were not at home. And many other neighbors who are not abutters also signed. We think this is a really good project for the site, far better than any other project would be. After it's built, there would be no impacts, no traffic, no pollution, no intrusions. The developers have agreed to meet many conditions. Now, I don't want to go through the whole list, because we've already gone through this, right? We, mm -hmm. you know, they've agreed to you know, the noise, and the fence, and the DP, and the brownfields, and all that. The one thing that Dick mentioned is very interesting because by having the solar panels here, the railroad will not be able to expand into that area once they're built or use it for purposes that the town cannot control. For example, a few years ago, the railroad had live workers there in many trailers, including a food trailer. Our town could not inspect anything, couldn't inspect the food, the sewage control, or the noise, because the railroad falls under state regulations, not local town regulations. Having the solar panels there will stop the railroad using it, it, that area, for any other purposes. Now, as far as I understand, the planning board voted okay on this, voted for this on November 15th to allow this project. I watched the YouTube today, and this is what I understood. The developers, the, the developers have willingly agreed to all the conditions that the town has asked for. Now the ZBA has to decide whether to grant the variances. Okay, variances are granted on hardships. It's, we already went through this. It's a long, narrow, skinny site with the wetlands in between. Uh, the developers therefore cannot meet the setbacks. They also can't build a smaller version to meet the setbacks because it wouldn't be economically viable. We empathize with the ZBA not wanting to override our town's regulations. We actually agree with them most of the time. Regulations were formulated with only the best interests of the town, its human neighbors, and the environment. We agree that in most cases, it's important to abide by the town regulations. But in this case, our neighborhood actually thinks that granting these variances would be better for the town and better for the neighborhood. And we think that the ZBA exists to interpret regulations for the best use of the town. In the joint meeting with the planning board, there was an awful lot of discussion that the regulations for commercial solar were out of date. The planning board has not had time to revise these regulations. It's very possible if the solar bylaws had already been revised, 
the developers might not have to have been here before you. So, in the neighborhood's opinion, no terrible precedents will be set if you grant the variances. The neighborhood thinks that the intention of the bylaws was not to discourage solar, <coughs> but to protect the neighbors. And in this case, the neighbors actively want the solar development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just some thoughts of my own. First off, I, I want to—I I forgot, but I want to apologize to Bernie also because I'm one of the residents that, that approached him. And I had no idea that we weren't supposed to do that, and just out of knowing you and I consider you a friend of mine. That's that's what the conversation was about. I was in no way encouraged by anybody else to do it. So, well, but, see, that's why when you came to me, I said I couldn't talk to you. Yep. And that upset Understood. me the fact that you put me in a position that I could not listen to the, the uh, people that live there. And that's totally inappropriate for, for anybody to do that and put us in a position that we cannot represent the town members that uh, appoint us to this position and we represent. And so Steve, I know Steve was upset to me and I, I had talked to you on the phone. I, I said, I can't say anything. Then I, was, I said to you, I would explain to you why later on. Understood. But that put me in a very un uncomfortable position. Um, I don't think that's what I need to be doing, uh, and that was because I got phone calls, and I went to the building inspector, and I, I assume he talked to you, and I continued to get the second one, and when I got the second one, I was furious, because it was supposed to stop, and it didn't stop, and so when you came to see me, Steve, that's why I was, I was kind of rude, but I was not happy. And that put me in an uncomfortable position that I couldn't listen to town members who had concerns. Yeah. So understood. So with, with that in light, I'm here to talk to you. <laughs> um, basically, what it was, was was I listened to what you had said at the, at the last planning board meter, meeting. And um, there was, it, it was basically um, the ZBA, uh, the, the planning board and the ZBA, the ZBA had expressed that that if it were to come to a vote, that the four, four votes would not be met. So that's, that's part of, of your no vote, um, or your possible no vote, I should say. Um, the explanation for the no votes, as far as I can recall, in short, uh, were explained as, as this. The, the town has existing zoning restrictions voted on by the town, and that you didn't think that uh, should be overridden that the project had to stay within the, the C2 100 foot setbacks uh, to, protect, to, to protect the people and that you know what the traffic is like on River Road. River Road is a scenic area and that you'd like to, to keep it that way. Um, I don't disagree with it. It is a scenic road, but that section of River Road, not, not so much. It's not very scenic. We know that, Bernie. In fact, the further you go down River Road towards 5 and 10, it gets, it gets worse. And there's other projects going on down there that we do want to talk about. Um, so it, it just seemed like you were trying to back up the bylaws of the town. Um, and I respect that. But I have to ask, what, what is the ZBA's purpose? Aren't you guys here to, to make changes, to help make changes to the bylaws? I can answer, I mean, yeah. we had, I personally had specific questions that were brought up because the, there was some conflicting wording in what we can and can't do variances on. And we had got an opinion, now we have an opinion from town council that I'm satisfied with the opinion of town council that cited some, some case law, you know. So I don't, you know, we were unsure, you know, there's some conflicting wording that was, I was unsure of last time. and. We, we wanted, a, and we didn't have this presentation last time either. Mm -hmm. and we didn't have 35 yeah. signatures and, yeah. and these things in front of us. So to me, this is an entirely different hearing than what we had in November with different facts and circumstances. Okay. Um, and, and that's where I am. And that's where my discussion was when we, when we discussed this as a board last time was there was information that we wanted clarified from town council and we thought that the there was information out there from the presenters that should have been clarified, and 
you know, it doesn't, I don't know how people are going to vote, but right. I think the answers are better. To me, the answers are more satisfactory. So, so with that, I mean, I, I just, I want to say that, you know, the, the, the people, the town, that's, that was, seemed to be the biggest worry was that you would be saying something against the people of the town, but the fact of the matter is the, the people of the town put you here to help with, with ma them making their decisions for them. I, I, I'm assuming that. Well, we're an appointed board. I mean, we're not elected. Okay. And, you know, we have to grant variances based on hardships. And, you know, the question is, what is a hardship? And then how much leeway do we have? And then there's also a question that when you do something for one person, does it affect the next applicant? And are you opening yourself up or opening the community up for liability? Now, each case has a specific set of circumstances. And what is that hardship? And is this unique? So if this case or the next case that we have regarding, you know, let's say a building on North Main Street or whatever, is that a unique set of circumstances that doesn't in turn set a precedent where the next applicant says, you did this for John, now you have to do it for Jim and you're opening yourself up for liability. And I think that's what Mr. St. Peter's biggest concern was when we talked about different conflicting bylaws and we have, you know, we've had some precedent in that. And we don't want to open ourselves up for failure. I personally don't want to be in a position to open myself up for failure to say, you green light one thing, you have to green light everything. And you have to be able to justify that, that we treat everybody fairly, we treat every applicant fairly, and we respect the zoning bylaws that are voted at town meeting. Right, but there is a process they have to go to. It's not, you're just not giving a green light to everybody that comes in here. It's people that are, are looking well, for the variance on, on the, the bylaws, on the, on, the, on the zoning. Steve, we didn't have this information last meeting. Okay. The, the planning board was waffling. We were trying to get something from them. We didn't get any of this information. So <coughs> on the, acting on the best interests of what we thought was best for the town, we did what we did. Okay. This is an entirely different presentation, okay. and I think we can stop right there. So I should stop? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Frank, you want to read this and what she says down here? You want me to read it? Yes. I just want to give you a point of information. Mm -hmm. Anything that's opened up at the ZBA for discussion, you can make conditions on anything your heart desires mm -hmm. to put in reason. Mm -hmm. That includes fencing, that includes this and that, and shrubbery and whatever. It doesn't need to go through the planning board. And you can add to anything the planning board does, you can't take away. Okay. Okay? You can, you can make any kind of condition you mm -hmm. want. That's absolutely in, in the cards. You want me to read, can, can we read this? Sure. Uh, a comment was made here, but there was a question here. This is from legal counsel in the town of Deerfield. That there was a, was a question of variance setback. It's not to say that the variance should be issued. That is a matter for the ZBA but not entirely discretionary, I, I, e.g., as compared to a special permit by, by example. Variances are to be sparingly granted and appropriately only when there are all, when all statutory requirements have been satisfied. So Thanks, Bert. That helps us explain it or not, but that's what our council told us. Okay, you got a comment? Uh, Bernie, thanks for, first, before, um, thanks for the Steve Anderson, 617 River Road. Thanks for reading that. I'm actually still a little bit confused about what that means. So could you or one of you rephrase that in layman's terms about what, what that advice means to you? Your, um, what Bernie just read. This what Bernie little, just read. You want me to and comment if that's, on it? And if, and if, and if uh, is that the same thing that um, uh, Adam just referred to in terms of Okay. Uh, advice this is the comment we got from our, from our Yeah, there, there was a couple yes. questions that were, were on there, but, you know, I think the point on that is that there has to be a specific set of cir circumstances that right. variances shouldn't be granted on a routine basis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, Regarding the neighbors, uh, how often do you see a large group of people who would be directly affected by a development project actively petitioning in favor of the project? 
There are 35 signatures on, on the letter petition that we submitted to you, and everyone is either in a butter, a near neighbor, or within earshot of the railroad. Not only do we not object to the project, we want the project for the, all the reasons that have been stated by other people. Um, the project proponents have been very attentive to the concerns of abutters and neighbors and have made adjustments uh, to address those concerns. It's hard to imagine a project developer that would, would have been more responsive in this respect than this project proponent. Um, now, I don't know if this is opening up the can of worms or the, the you know, if you, uh, if you approve something for one person, you gotta approve it for the next person that comes along. Uh, but I'm just uh, looking, I was looking at the, uh, uh, the minutes from the ZBA meeting on July 9th, 2015, where the uh, solar project installation uh, by the quarry was approved. And uh, that was an extra large scale ground mounted solar electric installation. And it was an 18 acre project in the C2 zone. The size of the solar installation was six megawatts, three times larger than the two megawatts this bylaw specifies. Um, and the one here, of course, well, uh, is 2.5 megawatts, which is uh, DC, which is only 25% greater than the current uh, bylaw limit. Um, and I guess it's under that if you're computing it by uh, AC. Anyway, um, but looking at the minutes of what was considered for the approval of that variance, um, uh, it, was, it says in the minutes that the use variance is necessary because of the size and the zone. And it says this use will not interfere with the current use. There will be no demands on services and it will be a good source of income for the town. I think you could say the very same things about this particular project. Um, there's, there's really very little that says about what was actually discussed, but I'm just reading for the minutes and they hopefully reflect the depth of the conversation that was, that took place. But so a motion was made to grant the use variance. Uh, the conditions of the variance were one, that the planning board approve decommissioning costs. Two, that the plan be approved by the planning board. Uh, the motion was seconded and the motion passed unanimously. So, um, just wanted to point that out. Thanks very much. Thank you. Just a much. Uh, Logan Slusky, 729 River. Uh, I would just kind of like to add a perspective to the project. I think a lot of the neighbors, uh, we kind of have a, a broken window policy. Every year we walk over a road and we pick up mountains of garbage, mountains of tires and waste that just discarded. And one of the worst, one of the most difficult portions is this particular plot of land. Uh, I myself have gone in there and picked up dozens of tires. Well, I'll go at least a half a dozen, something like that. Uh, and that's only over the last two years since we've been there. Uh, I think that any use at this point uh, that would beautify the neighborhood would be fantastic. Uh, I'm, boy, am I glad we have the ZBA here to go through all of these kinds of really small details. This is phenomenal. I really appreciate it. Uh, the only concern I would have about is about maintaining the arborvitaes or the hemlocks. As someone who maintained acres of those for years, if you let them grow for too long, they'll eventually keel over with a good snow. But again, that's really detailed stuff. Uh, I have to say, I'm really thrilled about this project. At least it's something, something that will prevent people from looking at this as just another place to get rid of stuff. Thank you. Thanks. One more? Sure. Okay. Um, Lynn Rose, 3 McClellan Farm Road. I just, um, some I think I want to represent where we're coming from as a community is as someone who's overseen the cleanup of the railroad and particularly Lake Asphalt, that took me a good 10 years to get on the books and been overseeing the cleanup at the railroad. 
I've received calls from Steve Assing about not being able to breathe up at the railroad, the exhaust, um, the fact that it's a contaminated site. I mean, there's at least 12 hazardous waste sites there. The thought that when we were fighting the salt shed, it was really, we didn't want more exhaust and more trucks and, you know, it's like, it's a, it, it's a mixed use incompatible. And so I think what, what the community is saying, and I'm, I was seven years on the planning board and I was part of developing the solar um, bylaw and I don't believe in undermining the, um, the town bylaws at all that we voted in at town meeting. But I think we're coming from a place of we have a, a incompatible use here. And so if that can weigh in on the fact that having a solar uh, site array minimizes the impact, it's really coming from a place of we live there. These people have been there for, I mean, I've been around 25, 30 years, have been there and really been through a lot dealing with impacts in that site. And so we're really trying to reconcile. I think we haven't done it through zoning, um, but we're really trying to reconcile an incompatible use. Um, and, you know, it took us a long time to get lake asphalt cleaned up, but it still looks like it really affects property values and things like that and looking at these pictures and what they're going to do and if there's real follow through and we can make a commitment to follow through. The responsiveness from these folks is far different than what we dealt with with the other proposal. And so I think it's really about the health and well-being about the neighborhood. Thanks. Okay, I, at this time, if, is there anybody opposed to this project that w that's here that would like to speak? I think we've heard a lot of uh, people who are for it. Um, so if there's nobody else that's opposed, um, then we'll close the meeting and we'll have a board discussion. And board members have any questions? I have a question. Okay. All right, well, at this time, the meeting is closed. It's to the public. It's 840. Thanks. Can I ask yes, a question? Yeah. Is the site going to be monitored uh, remotely with uh, like live feed video? Is there anything? I know the, the resident brought up a trash um, dumping concern. Is is that something that they're going to cover with, with cameras? So if there's people dumping stuff, that would be reported or not necessarily? Yeah, the answer is yes. You put cameras on as the transformers are. to check when it's time to mow grass or um, if there are any issues and alarms, we can check what the condition of the site is. Thanks. Well, I just have some concerns. Uh, again, um, I see that the railroad's going to get 56 feet and the people get 65 feet. I'd like to see that moved back a little bit give us uh, 75 feet, and that would allow us to have another set of trees in there if we needed it. Um, I think you're asking the, the taxpayers to, to take the brunt of it. Um, you know, I, I would agree with that. And the second thing is I think this really should have been brought forward to us before this meeting. This puts us on a spot, uh, as I can only speak for myself, but to have this dropped on us looks like um, this is going to be a rubber stamp committee. And I do not feel that I want to serve on a committee that does that. Uh, this should have been given to us in a, uh, a reasonable amount of time, which I think is two weeks, so we could have looked this over. Uh, you're asking for a, a quick decision, and I think that's inappropriate that any town group do that. Uh, it looks bad for a committee to vote on something that someone drops on our lap and it's an immediate vote, whether it's for or against. Um, it, looks, it looks inappropriate. It looks like we didn't look in, at the, what was going on and look at the best interests of the town. Um, I would have felt a lot more comfortable if, uh, if you had given us two weeks ago so we could have looked at this and made some decisions and looked at it and paroused it ourselves and had time. You're, you're putting us in a spot where we make a quick decision. And I think that's inappropriate for us to do. That's my opinion. I'm only one of the board members. But it would have been nice if we had had this two weeks ago to look at it because it's a, it's a whole different plan. And I don't know that we can legally vote on a new plan since it's not what's been presented to us. You know, that's, you, you, you've, you've had this what you had. And I kept checking in the office to see if a new plan came through and I got nothing. Then I got a call today that there's a new plan. Well. 
are we voting on the new plan or are we voting on the old plan? Um, that's a question I have, and like I said, I, I would really feel a lot more comfortable if the, the roadside got 10 more feet so that if they needed another row of trees in there, they could get it. Bob? Uh, some of the things that I wrote down, my handwriting's not very good. My handwriting's not very good because of my elderly age. Okay. Uh, I think if the board chooses to move forward, uh, they need to make a finding for hardship based up, relative to the setbacks based upon a top topo and unique footprint, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, as for the bond, um, I don't like $2,500 a year. Uh, they ought to put up 100000 to start with, and it be good for the 25-year duration so that it can get taken out at some time. And, or they can put cash, they can put cash up maturity, but they need to put it up front, in my opinion. Uh, the terms and conditions should be as per the oral presentation tonight, with the exception of the 65 feet be increased to 75 feet, uh, and that probably no action be taken on the use variance due to the size being under the two and not over the two, where it's a permitted use in the C2 area. So those are my thoughts. Okay. Others are entitled to their opinions. Yeah, well, closed, 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 closed. 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 No. Sorry, but Frank yeah. will tell you that it's closed. closed. Yeah. But it's a point of information. No. Hmm. So are they formally changing it to these numbers for the setbacks? Well, Bernie just asked for formally 75, right? Yeah, I said 75. I'd be comfortable with 75. But is that yeah. what they formally... No, so 65. We're, so we're changing... The setback in the that's what that was my we're going to change yeah. we did that before we'll just we would change the wording have Hand to come and sign it that, they, that we're changing what they're requesting are you, that's what we you if, okay with if there is a if there is a decision the decision would be that the variance for dimensions would be granted based upon what we have represented this evening which is the the 65 yeah okay. though we're hearing the 75 piece yeah um the 56 and then the 44. Mm -hmm. Okay, the quick, okay. Is the 75 okay? Okay. The yes. other thing is, the, yes. can you wait? Is it, would, would it be a, a problem waiting the two weeks? We have another meeting coming up in two weeks. Would that be a problem to wait two weeks? If you could wait two weeks, you come and we have the meeting, you come in here, we sign the paper, away we go. You have it rewritten, and, and it's a formal document. Uh, instead of a scribble on a piece of paper, I, I'm not... So maybe I'll just put a, a finer yeah. point because I heard about the 1.98 megawatts AC and the way I'm looking at it is how you've made other decisions and, and variances to your point don't create precedent because by their very nature they're on their own parcel, right? Because it just by its nature can't create precedent. So we're trying to be conservative by looking at it DC, which it exceeds the threshold. So my concern would be, with all due respect to Mr. Kalaszewski, if we did go because there's certain things beyond town control. If we were to go to the planning board, receive an approval from them, even with whatever discretion that the building inspector slash zoning enforcement officer had, the interpretation would, could be from somebody appealing that, no, it says two megawatts, it's undefined, DC. And so our position is, and it's twofold because there's a second piece to this, um, is that the conservative position is a use variance is appropriate because then we're beyond reproach of going to the planning board and have somebody later say, no, 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 you should have got a use variance, which sets us back. The other piece, quite frankly, is the timing. You saw in one of the slides, January 25th, 2019, as 25% of a payment need to be made to Eversource. Can I disclose the amount? So there's a $140,000 payment that has to be given to Eversource on January 25th, 2019. They're not going to make that payment unless they know that there's a project here. I don't know that we could, even if, given the uncertainty of the planning board, and it seems like for the most part this board appreciates, understands what's in front of them. We're hearing from the abutters, and so we would ask for that use variance because it looks like from town council you do have the ability to grant it. 
Um, so we would ask for that to be granted because I don't frankly know that we could get in front of the planning board who we don't know what they're going to do, how long they're going to take. And frankly, we're up against that January 25th date, which there could be no project if they say we're not going to make that payment because that's $140,000 we're not going to get back after all the fees that we paid. So that, that's, you know, there's the legal aspect of it and then there's that practical aspect. Hopefully that's deemed equitable. Though. Rich? I want to point out for you, Frank, there's three different numbers in the presentation. Mm -hmm. It was 2.7, 2.5, 1.9. You need to pick one of the numbers and stick with that number, okay? I think a precedent needs to be set, personally, Mr. Attorney. I, I think the precedent needs to be set to the ACDC. I'm going to defer that to your electrical mm -hmm. member to clarify some of that because I think we could run into another project someplace else that not defined create us a problem. Mm -hmm. So at no. some point that needs to be clarified. Well, the, ex the, the AC numbers will be even lower. Yes, that's correct. Well, but it'll be even lower than what they stipulated because you're going through a second transformer. And transformer losses range from between 2 and 8 percent. So even though it's 1.94, it, it'll probably be less because you're going from single phase to three, I assume three phase here, correct? Yeah. Right, I mean, so you're gonna, have a, you're gonna have a loss there, a heat loss in the transformer. Transformers don't, aren't 100% efficient, so you're gonna have between two and 8% loss. So the number you're giving us is actually gonna be even lower than what you stated. And the difficulty may be, when I look at your bylaw, when you're defining these things, you're defining them by what it seems like area, right? So it says two megawatts or 10 acres. And so when we're talking about size, it sounds to me, and I'm not an electrician, we're talking about DC because that's what those panels can produce based versus what the transformer actually outputs. So if, and again, uh, a little bit self-serving because I've just explained everything about the January 25th date, but that, that's where we would be coming from and suggesting that DC would be the appropriate. And we would settle on what the proposal is for is 2.5 megawatts DC. And if that needs to, and I know to Mr. Kalaszewski's point, there's you know AC right up there. We mentioned the pilot, and we had 1.98 megawatts AC. We would look for consistency of 2.5 megawatts DC okay. across the board, and we could update or adjust. You know, when we have south array capacity, we would change that measurement to DC as well, just for consistency. But that would be the proposal. So my question is still not answered. Could you cut back? Could you give us two weeks to look at this, or a week? We got, we got a meeting coming up in two weeks. Well, let's talk about that, because you need two more weeks. Right. You uh, would yeah, like two I, weeks. I feel oh, very comfortable with the amount of information we have. I, to I do, too, but I think the perspective looks, it's going to look like we're a rubber stamp committee. But we're not. Well, we're not. Well, we got a situation in town when no, that's but happened. We've been, this is the third time we've gone through. We have all done a but lot of research. But this is all new information. Some That's of the it's issue. new, some of it's not new. The information is new. The, the footprint has not changed. Right. I, I just want to comment on the, on the, the numbers that were 1.98 megawatts AC. We are committed to that number. That's remaining the same. That is committed per the ISA with Eversource. That number cannot change. If that changes, that requires us to reapply with Eversource. So that number is not going to change. It's 1.98 megawatts AC. Yeah. And the difference that's happened from 2.7 to 2.5 it was due to, said so economics, we've actually changed the size of our panels from 400 watt panels to 385 watt panels just because they are more economic for the project at this point. Um, so that way we are actually, we've downsized the project from 2.7 to 2.5. So the final numbers are 2.5 megawatts DC, 1.98 megawatts AC. And we allow, you know, here's the deal. Mm. <laughs> they, don't, they don't need anything, two megawatts AC or less. So. He had a very good point. You could clarify that by saying no greater than 2.5 DC, yeah. no, more, no greater than mm -hmm. 2 yep. AC. So that, that would, would satisfy yep. me when they came, if they get approved the and they yep. came for a building permit, that would satisfy the requirements and keep everything neat and clean. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, Thank back you. to the business about two, two weeks. Once <clears throat> we start a situation, that we start doing this, we're going to set a precedent. Well, we could. I mean, we've already had a precedent up there that they, you're looking at the last, uh, last uh, situation. It's been brought up. So it, it, either whether it counts or not, it's been brought up. 
So if we start on a board that starts letting people drop stuff in and we, jo we start choosing on it, then, it, then it, we basically said, we accept that kind of stuff. And I'm not comfortable with that. If you, know, if you can wait two weeks, you put it out there a week, we got a meeting coming up in two weeks, we make the stipulations, if we agree to this 1.9, there's no, you don't have to go to the planning board. Correct? In, incorrect. So. Oh, incorrect. Yes. So in the C2 oh. zoning district, okay. we, go to the we would need a special permit from the planning board. Still got to finish with the planning board. The, but didn't they vote for it at the last? Uh, Richard? Yeah. They passed it the over. Whole thing, but they have to go back to the planning yeah. board. Oh, mm. okay. So we could put on a stipulation on ours that they follow the planning board. Mm -hmm. You could just put a stipulation on it that they got to mm -hmm. meet the planning board requirements mm -hmm. and it's over. Mm -hmm. right. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't think you're and I don't think that, that by that. You know, then that's then they're going to very simple. If you okay. stipulate they have to have planning board, mm -hmm. they have to produce a planning board special permit. That solves mm -hmm. that problem. Yep. The only other thing that we were discussing is uh, conditions. And if there's any conditions that you guys feel that should be attached to that, you should do well, some of that. The bond was the one, another thing that. Yeah, I wanted hundred thousand dollars up front. Is that the, is the bond written as a condition, or is that considered part of their thing we're voting on? That, since it's that a can be a condition. That would be a condition. I almost defer that to the planning board, but mm -hmm. that's just my own personal yeah. opinion. I, okay. I'm Do they have that, more experience with I'm sending not that bonds? Familiar with bonds? Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. if the twenty-five hundred dollars is a cash payment every year, yeah. uh, or if it's a payment on the bond. So typically, and I won't directly answer that question, I'm going to be more general. So, so, <laughs> that's, that's my okay. so, in other, so I do this a lot in other municipalities, and a lot of the times what happens is that it is set as a condition to be determined later. And so essentially what happens is the engineer would say, here's how much we think it's going to cost in 20 years to get rid of this. Here's what we expect the salvage value to be of that material. Let's net it out and figure out what that number mm -hmm. is. And then let's come up with a mechanism to set cash bond. And it differs amongst municipalities mm -hmm. to say, OK, it, it's rare to have it all funded right at the start. Typically, it's phased in over time. You know, they'll start, I've seen it, five years or 10 years. And then by the either fifth or 10th year, it's fully funded sits there and then ultimately if it has to be used or accessed it's used or accessed and there can also be separate decommissioning agreements which ultimately would allow because i understand the problem that the town is having getting onto that land it might make sense for the town to have an agreement in place where we say if we don't decommission it at the end of its useful life um, at the expiration of the commercial operation date we will allow the town to get in and to access that decommissioning. And so effectively, we would have the, le uh, the lessor, the landlord, sign it. I, as, as going over all this stuff, I almost think I would defer the bond requirement to the Board of Selectmen because they handle all the other bond type issues in town and all the financial details in town. And I would kind of think I'd defer to them and would it be practical that they they have to negotiate a payment in lieu of taxes that hasn't been done yet correct it has not that's that correct that's correct we have to have drafts we have drafts but not five yeah correct. yeah that ranges there's so a we, big range some are zero and some are three thousand so they've still got to negotiate that right. and i and think i dropped the bond on them at the same time yeah. because they do all this for this everything that goes on for all every construction project. Job. So it's like an escrow account. It's like an escrow account. Yes. I think I dumped that on the selection. Okay. Yeah, okay. Because, uh, but also, in some of these, they put in a um, inflationary rate. Correct. They put an inflationary rate, for example, if you have concrete that's pure concrete or concrete with rebar in it, then that's a, the, the destruction costs change. So and also inflationary rates. They had average inflation. Bernie has a real good point. Mm -hmm. Because concrete without rebar can be crushed to six inch in size and buried anywhere. It's not considered hazardous. But concrete with rebar is a different story now. You must remove it from the site and have it recycled someplace else. So there's a big difference in the whatever's here. Okay. So I think I really, this is just input for you guys. I think I defer this negotiation for the tax things and the bond things to where it belongs back at the head office. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you. Is that okay with you, Bob? Is that That's fine. I love okay. the fact that thinking that you're going to get on, this is going to be the way to get on that site 25 years from now. If the people that own that solar farm decide to walk away from it, the railroad is not going to let you near it. <laughs> they could just walk away. They've made their money. Hmm. Whereas if we've got a $100,000 bond, uh, we've got at least $100,000. That's my thinking. Well, well you, maybe you're the right. select board thinks well, I hope has, so. has things like that in place already. <laughs> and Bob, in talking to other people that put these on, they've had that problem, and that was a concern because normally what happens with these sites is they've changed, they change hands two and three times. So what they do is they remove themselves from the liability of the cleanups. So to protect the town, which we should be doing, so that we're not stuck with a cleanup like we were in other places. So if you put a bond down there, um, that and like I said, the inflationary costs. What well, I don't think they're using rebar. They're probably just going to use a little stinker glob, right? Just for just for the ballast block. Right. So, so that's, that's, correct. that's correct. but those things have to be figured in because they do. You know, I think the Worthington plant, uh, the Worthington operation, was very specific about the cleanups because there have been towns that have been stuck with cleanups, and I don't think that's a responsibility that we want to leave on our town taxpayers to clean up after someone's made a pile of money. Mm -hmm. well, if we have $100,000 up front, the treasurer can invest it in some long-term mm -hmm. you know, operations or wherever the best place to invest it. So by the, in 20 years out, hopefully it's doubled. Mm -hmm. And uh, what have you, because if you just get 2500 bucks a year, right? It's, you know, it, maybe you got to. We'll leave that up to the this select. This is the input for yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I don't think this board has the authority to regulate no. the bond. I think it's because the selectmen have the authority to regulate that bond. You mm -hmm. can send recommendations to that. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty sure that an appointed board in a jurisdiction like this can't negotiate dollar figures that commit, commits the town to. Anyway. Okay. So that is correct. We planted the seed. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. Are we all prepared to vote um, now at this point? Motion. All right. Okay. Well, one more question. Okay. Are we going with the 75 feet? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, so, am I going to vote or is Adam going to vote? We need since we're changing from this, do we need to have them come up and sign something? Remember how we did that when we had the bed and mm -hmm. breakfast? We had mm -hmm. to have them come and sign something different they were voting on yeah. Yeah, versus the can, original? Right. We can change the megawatts. And um, just to add that the Board of Selectmen will make the decision on the bond. You know what you make us make me feel like? One of those guys on television, those uh, okay, so reality shows. When they're fixing something, the those, guy goes, I can't put the thing together because I can't get a transmission. Really in Southern correct. California, there's a million the transmission shops. Yeah, but are we supposed to put that in here? I just mm. wish you could give it a six I, I think we should. Don't yeah. you? Yeah. 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 So. Well, also, um, one more point of contention that we make this, that with, this applies only to this um, application so that this doesn't set a legal precedent afterwards based upon the uniqueness of the property right so we don't get someone coming up and saying well they did it on this last one um, specific only to this am I right mr. Kalashevsky is that sound about right Topography. Oh, I think the record will reflect Late that. Night. Oh, Richard, the record will would reflect that. You know, we're, so, that we're granted the variance based on. Yeah. To talk about the reason, need to do the motions. Right. Right. You need to stop the mm -hmm. Yep. You need to do yep. the motion on what you what you're going to do here. Right. And you need to select the voters. Right. Right. That's right. my point. So we have two alternates. You and Bob. 
who wants to vote, who wants to not vote. I don't know if we can answer that question. Yeah, we yeah. Vote before, right? well, Bob, you voted last time. I voted last, last time. time. Okay. Right. <laughs> I'll vote today then. Okay. If that's what you want. Right. That's fine. Is that okay with you, Mr. Decker? Hey, uh, it's fine. You okay. Know, whatever whatever right. the board so feels. Okay. But I wanted to make sure that when you do make your findings, that you make the the finding for the hardship based upon the topo and the uniqueness of the mm -hmm. footprint. Mm -hmm. and, the, and my opinion was the setbacks, the, the hardship was for the setbacks, mm -hmm. and I didn't think we needed to take action on the other variance mm -hmm. request. Uh, I want to make sure that the bond is done, satisfied with the Board of Selectmen, that terms and conditions be based mm -hmm. upon the oral presentation with the exception of the 65 feet front of, uh, setback be increased to, to 75. and. Uh, that's about it. Yep, we got it all down. Just so you okay, so now we sure just need a motion it. here. Chairman, I make a yep. comment before you vote. Mm -hmm. Something very important to lay out is the 65 feet we're talking about is to the first panel. Mm -hmm. We have the access road in front of that, and we have drainage swales in front of that as well. Mm -hmm. If there's any sort of mitigation you need as far as visual, that could be within that drainage swale too. Okay. So that setback distance is to the first panel, not to the fence, okay. not to the road, but to the fence. Okay. Just Thank you. Minute. Thank you. So we should read this. Mm -hmm. we'll make the yes. Do I make a motion that we well, speak in the microphone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't even hear you over here. I'm sorry. <laughs> should I read this when I make my motion? Yes. All right. The entire thing. Um. I make a motion that we vote on um, granting the variances according to the way it's worded here. In accordance with Deerfield Zoning Bylaw, Solar Electric Installations Environmental Resource Management on behalf of Mass RE 12 LLC has prepared this request for two zoning variances, site use variance and setback variance. The proposed project involves a construction of a 20 acre portion of the existing Deerfield Rail Yard property at 100 Rail Road Yard Road. The proposed use for this site is to install solar panels that will generate approximately 2.5, that's where I corrected it, um, megawatts of DC current electricity. Can I? Yep. Slash 1.98 megawatts AC electricity, uh, da, da, da. solar generation greater than 2 point megawatts requires the site use variance in commercial zones. The solar panels will be installed to the south of the existing rail yard on property owned by Pan Am Southern LLC. The zoning bylaw for commercial zones requires a setback distance of 100 feet from all property boundaries. The project is requesting to change setback to 75 foot front right? mm -hmm. and 25 foot side and rear setbacks. Do we need to clarify that the 75 feet to the solar panel, not to the fence line? Is that what you just pointed out? Mm -hmm. I just pointed out it's not yeah. 50, it's we changed it to 75. We, and I think what we were pointing out is that if you keep it as proposed, besides the optics of the 61 versus the 56, that hearing the concern about potential mitigation for the, the visibility of the array, there is sufficient room if you take a look in front of the fence behind the already the rows to of add additional bodies, right to add that where, where we could plant additional plantings and so I think the the suggestion was keep it at the 61 if it's going to mean we're not going to get the approval we'll go to 75 mm -hmm. whatever sort of horse trading that can be too. So are you are you essentially pushing back to, towards railroad yard if we take ten in the front? No, we can't push back any farther. So that's the size I think would shrink. You were clear, I thought you were clarifying the seventy-five foot on the on the frontage. Is that's that what correct? we are. Just seventy-five foot on, yeah. the, on, the, front. on the frontage. On the front. Correct. Okay. Not I just wondered if that's what their plan was. If yeah. they could take it oh, to shift go. back. Gotcha. Oh no 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 the, no! It can't be pushed back. No. I know, I know. If we could, trust me. Uh, I, I could comment that the railroad did ask for a um, 40, uh, 40 foot setback from the nearest rail line to the project. Um, so that is, that is a setback that we had to follow. 
um, with the railroad. And then, of course, and then we do have the, um, the fence, and then there has to be a per the building code 15 feet. Um, so that's why we're asking that specific rear setback, just to clarify. Right. Okay, second the motion that we vote. Oh. Yeah, I, maybe to, I kind of screwed everybody up by bringing us off track yeah. a little bit. So if the motion is for 75 mm -hmm. feet, yes, we will accept it. It will cause us to change and eliminate some of the panels um, or to come up with some sort of reconfiguration. Yeah, yeah, we'll, um, Our request or suggestion was based upon what Matt had said about having to hit the 1.98 megawatts AC for the interconnection service agreement with Eversource and given the fact that besides the optics of it where the rail yard is protected more than the neighbors, hopefully I haven't heard anything with the neighbors being concerned about this plan, if it is okay with the board keeping it at as proposed and just conditioning it on the plans as proposed, which would be 65 feet is the closest. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, a, I'll, I'm staying at 75 feet okay. because I think we need to protect the neighbors. I'm not concerned about the railroad, okay? If take a role they have provided out from the railroad if they have to. Um, and, but, you know, we're protecting the neighborhood, and that's what we need to be looking at. Um, if the railroad, you know, railroad can't give up 10 feet or something, that's, that's, uh, that's not fair to the to people that live there. Because they may... Okay. Oh, like I said. I understand. I understand. I understand. <clears throat> yes? Yes, 75 feet for the, the front. Yes. So seconded. Mm -hmm. I can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your vote? I'm in favor of the motion. Yes. Okay. Ready? I'm in favor of 75 feet. Yes, I am. I'll vote for it. I as well am in favor. Yes. Rich? Yes. Okay. Thank I think you. It looks much. unanimous. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay, so at this time, there's, I don't see any new business. I don't see any new business folder well, that, here. That, uh, Frank, that two feathers guy's on the agenda again. So we at least ask if he's here. Yeah. Not he's, here. He's not. I don't. Was he on for Frank? Frank? We're no, still in meeting. Yes. Yeah, no, that was last week. That was last. Oh, okay. yeah. Right. Yeah. Frank. Yes. I might suggest that somebody draft up your the decision. Yes. You know, and what have it with the right legalese and yeah. make sure it's all polished. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think yep. that needs to be a group effort and not just go right directly yep. to the clerk. Right. <laughs> you what know, was that I comment? Mean, I didn't hear that. What was that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know what I'm, I'm trying to get. Right. Okay. Right. So we're going to. Again, I, I look, don't want no that. Disrespect. Well, no disrespect. <laughs> no, no, I could. Never mind. I wouldn't want to disrespect you either. So. All right, so there's no new business, uh, so we need a motion to adjourn. And motion to adjourn. Okay. Second it. All in favor? All right.